So we're just going to follow up with you a bit we did the other day. Well, we, you might remember we pricked out the Digitalis parviflora, the perennial foxglove. That was a couple of weeks ago. And already these guys who went into square sevens um, are going to get potted up into a one litre sellable plant. Um, we did 90. Out of that, I chucked one, which was looking a little bit pooly. Um, you know, it took, but it was just had a bit of intervenal chlorosis, so that's gone. And there's a couple of pissy ones, like this guy, who'll get thrown in with another one to bulk up the plant. But generally speaking, you know, I've got about 87 out of 90, which is pretty good. Um, and you can see, if cameraman just comes and has a look, I'm shouldering them all off, like that. Just get all the weed seeds off, and there you go. So that was even the pissy little ones that I took um, and teased apart, if you remember. And already, you know, we've got 87 sellable little plants like that. And to reiterate, all we did was last summer was cut the head off one plant we had outside and save the seed. And just from doing that and that little bit of forethought and some care and management, we've got all these little plants which are going to make somebody very happy. So we're up in the tunnel. Uh, Thomas and I are doing this in the morning because it is punishing hot in these tunnels in the middle of the day. Um, and these are the shallots we showed you. Uh, they're drying out nicely. Thomas just pointed out these ones have shriveled right up. You can probably plant them now, but these lads have still got a lot of green in them. And that's just because they weren't as, they had more life left in them when I pulled them out. I could have left them longer. They weren't totally done. Um, but something I just want to show you really quickly is that you might find if you take them out a touch early, well, there's nothing wrong with doing that, but they might continue to grow even though they're out the ground. Um, and this keeps happening. You see the ones curling up, Thomas? Mm -hmm. These are the yeah, ones I've beheaded. And the bulb, the organ of perination, <laughs> keeps throwing these. And these are seed heads, these are flower heads. So when, you, you know, I don't really want the energy from here, which is what I'm going to eat, going into here. So I'm going to keep going and just keep an eye on your shallots when they're drying and your garlic and other things to keep snipping these off because although it's out of the ground it is still growing there's residual energy in there um so it's just something to be aware of and it's quite interesting to see you can really see what the plant's trying to do it's going oh shit i'm out of the ground i don't care i'm going to set seed you know it's the biological imperative of the plant um but these are coming on nice we have eaten some so that you know the numbers have thinned a bit so hopefully we'll have some left to plant before we gobble them all up. Um, and the, the seed heads, I should say as well, of shallots and garlic, these little guys. You want them bigger than that, really. But um, you can saute them in butter. It's a very, like, Creole dish. It's very, very good. Um, I know people who eat it raw. But that's good. Um, and here we are in the pottage I've seen for a while. Stuff, stuff will have changed a bit since you last saw it. Um, as I think I mentioned when I was in with Malcolm, that's because we're in a constant state in here of reap, sow, reap, sow, reap, sow. We don't grow in the old school way of stick it in, grow it on, take it out in the autumn. That's an old fashioned store crop way. We're not doing that. So all the salad leaves you saw here, the mizuna and stuff, um, that's all been eaten, that's all gone. Some of it's gone to pesto, some of it's gone to this and that. Um, so they react, are these guys in the middle. So that's a winter crop. They'll keep fattening. As the bulb gets bigger, you can't really see it yet, just at the base of that one. When they get a bit bigger, I'll start taking the side shoots off them, um, which you can eat in a stew. They are nice, they've got celeriac-y flavour. Um, but I'll keep taking them off so that the, the bulb fattens. Um, because of the fluctuations in temperature we've been having, which have been extreme, um, we are having a lot of bolting this year. Um, Things like, you know, the, the brassicas, the, the leaf brassicas are very prone to bolting. I'm not stressed about it, it happens. Um, this rocket here is bolting. Um, you can keep eating the leaves, but take the flower heads off. You can't stop them bolting, but you can slow them down. Um, things like the beets, that beet there is running up. Um, I'll get in and show you. Um, this beet here, you know, that's going to seed. So that wants to come off. Again, so you're not taking energy out of the bulb. Um, but I'll take that out fairly soon. Do just bear in mind, obviously, with beets, the tops are edible. So keep eating the tops, they're really good for you. And they're delicious, you can use them like a, like a green, like a spinach. 
make a good pesto as well. And um, the icebergs are looking really, really good. I'll show you this one here, Tom. They're looking like shore lettuces now. Look at the head in that. It's uh, really great. Um, with these, when I grow them, all the way through their growing, I harvest the outside leaves when they're young because they're much tastier when they're young. Um, and the head's still going to thicken. So keep nipping off them. And that makes them a really, really good crop because you're getting salad off them for months and months while that head's fattening. Mm -hmm. um, and then you're away. And um, this is some celery. This is self-blanching celery. Once upon a time, you had to blanch celery, which meant you would dug a ditch, grow it in the bottom and continually earth it up to keep the tender stem. Self-blanching, you don't have to do that, which is handy. Uh, this mizuna here is really bolted. Um, what I'll do is I'll cut all the flower heads off and take the rest and that'll be pesto. It'll be a bit woody now, the leaves, for, for salad. It'll make a great pesto. Later in the year, we will be leaving these to set seed so we can collect seed for next year. Because the straight species is not an F1 hybrid um, and we can get away with that. Um, Look at the baby sweet corn. Yeah, you know? that's Lizzie's baby sweet corn. Your favourite. I said was going to do nothing. You'll be noticing a theme occurring here of Lizzie one, George zero. Which has not escaped my notice. That's almost two zero. Yeah, yeah. Uh, anyway, <laughs> but Lizzie's better than me, so know when you're beaten. Um, the beets are getting away really nicely in there. Um, again, I'll, I'll harvest these tops and they are really tasty. Don't write the tops off. Um, the garlic is nearly ready now. Um, it's, it has been throwing seed heads, which I've been cutting off. But the new growth tips it's throwing out are slowing down and they're dying at the tip, which pretty much means it's, they're about ready. Do just have a dig down and check the fattened, um, but they'll be coming out very soon. Um, this is where the shallots were. So that's become full up with brassicas. Um, I didn't expect everyone here to love the kale as much, but they do. My kale order every week. So mm. George, I don't want salad, can I have kale? So I've got loads more of that and there's more coming in there. And when the garlic comes out, more will go in here and this will become our autumn crop and winter crop. And I hope that's given you an idea of how you just keep everything moving, keep the land working, you know. Um, we will enrich it a bit, but you don't need to go mad. You don't need to dig it over. Stop messing with the soil structure, you know. Here's where it um, gets a bit more difficult. This is all the hot climate stuff I was mentioning before. Squashes, legumes, um, I will accept on these courgettes, no, they're not climbing yet. That's just because they're just too young. They're very, very short. Um, the squashes are finally getting away. But again, in a normal year, I'd expect these by August. We're in July now, but by August, you'd expect them up here. Um, which I don't think we're going to do. But it has just been, I mean, as much as 10 degrees below the temperatures we've had. Yeah, where it should be. Been nuts, you know. um, but you know, in anything that's failed, you'll notice some stuff is kind of different to the last time you saw it. I had some cucumbers in here and they just didn't do. Honestly, rip them out. Don't spend all summer looking at them being sad, you know, just take it out. We've got some sugar snaps in there and some monge too, and they're going to climb up there. I've put these strings in for them to grab onto and they'll be great. Oh, you know, we'll get some of them soon. Yeah. They're a bonny little thing. And you can eat the shoots as well. Don't eat all of them because they need some. The pea shoots are delicious. They're really good for you. Um, We've got some, some uh, an oak leaf lettuce, that's a really nice one. That's a uh, colonia, that one. Yeah, you just don't have any waste ground, do you? No, nah, we want to <laughs> really minimise that, you know, we want to get it in, get it in. Um, we've got a bit of mildew on these guys. It's not killing them so far. It's not bad, is it, Thomas, but it's there. I'm just looking at you. Double, Double decker. Barreled. Yeah, I've, I've bent the rules of science and I've grown. We were calling it a Siamese courgette, but we decided that was in bad taste. <laughs> So it's now the double barreled courgette, which someone's eaten. Oh, fuck. See that? I checked it two days ago and it was fine. Anyway, we can cut that bit out. Um, this rocket's bolted as well, the salad rocket. Again, pesto. But its flower is actually quite pretty. Oh, yeah. It's just a lovely black venation in the top. Um, getting a bit better up this end because this is slightly cooler climate so french climbing beans these are really nice these are right up here um 
actually the violet, the cross violet. Um, mm. a, a bloody massive. They're on the way back down. Yeah, I know. Um, I keep trying to tie them on, but they keep running up. So I'll probably nip the tips out to make them bush up now. But I, I didn't before because I was that paranoid about them not making it. Um, we've got more more kale. Um, and the brassicas have loved the cool and damp. Um, I've got nasturtiums mixed in. These are starting to flower. I think last time we showed you this variegated form, mm. which is cool, isn't it? Mm, um, vomit splattered leaf. It's really vomit splattered. Um, I, I would say checked with a delicate porcelain hue, but there we go. Um, <laughs> and that's blue pepper, just doing well. Russell's with sprout. a delicate porcelain hue. Yeah, that's no, a lot of shit, but it's kind of like people liking it. If Monty Don said it, I'd get a knighthood. But there you go. Um, <laughs> sorry, it's a bit like keeping up appearances between us two, isn't it? Pretty much, yeah. Either that or like step tone turn. <laughs> uh, Timon and Pumba, I mean, they all work. Wishmo yeah. and I. Um, Not saying that we're a couple, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much. We're both very much yeah. cripplingly single men. Is this. Not yet, I'll get in. <laughs> is this Mrs. Bouquet and I'm Richard? Hang on, what? Keeping up Why appearances. Am I Mrs. Bouquet? Hmm? Let's talk about this when we get home. <laughs> <laughs> um, not in front of the audience. Um, so this, uh, we've been picking away at these, these Cavalo Nero. Um, so have the pigeons, but you know, whatever. And um, the purple sprouting got so badly pigeoned, those are replacements I grew. It sucks, but it happens. Um, yeah, even some days have been yeah, pigeoned. It's bloody wood, wood pigeons. Um, we do cover them, but I just don't love covering, because one, it's a hassle to get off. It's a hassle to harvest, it's a hassle to weed. And at the end of the day, we are open to the public and it's just ugly, a lot of it. Um, cover if you need to, but I, you know, I don't want CDs hanging and all that kind of jazz. And, um, but these are good. You can see with, with the kale how we harvest it up the stem. So you just keep picking up the stem, the new growth comes. But keep harvesting, you know, if you don't harvest, the plant's not gonna keep producing leaves. And again, it's that thing about the biological imperative. Um, what does the plant want to do? You know, ask yourself that question and you'll generally work out, you know, what you need to do. Um, but that's how it's going, you know, it's a big difference from when you last saw it. And I would say, I don't know what you think, Thomas, but I would say given how atrocious the weather's been, we're actually doing really well. It's been a pretty, it's been a decent success. It is just, like you say, the hot climate stuff. Yeah. Like, the only bit that's letting it down is like this section here, out the full thing. I but mean, it, it looks pretty, it looks full. We can't control the weather. No, and it's just, vegetable growing, I think, is really at the very cutting, cut and thrust of where climate change is being really just a pain. I mean, it's obviously disastrous for people in other countries. But I think for most people on the street, your average person, your average home gardener, I think veg growing is where it's most obvious. We're getting a lot of members of the public coming in saying to us, what the hell's going on with my tomatoes, with my squashes? And we bring them up here and we say, look, it's the same for us. It's not, you're not doing anything wrong, but you, you just can't control the weather. So there you go. I don't see the benefit. I just don't. No, I don't. Well, you don't have to water it, really. We've hung a pepper and I don't really know why. Because I found that in my shed and I wanted to use it. Liz found this upside down growing thing in the shed and wanted to use it. So we put a pepper in it and it's gonna solve all of life's problems. Probably not available anymore because it's about 15 years old. It's got over and under the upside down planter. Why? Because why not? I had to shove it through a tiny hole and it was a bit much for a little pepper. I don't personally understand with up, upwards growing this, personally. Oh, it's dripping. But we'll see. Yeah, that's meant to happen. To be honest, Lizzie, it, it looks like you've hung it there as a warning to the other peppers. <laughs> the other peppers are behaving. I've got lunchbox if mix. don't bear fruits, this is happening to you. <laughs> We've soon got little flowers, we're going to have peppers in no time. And I think these might be some little aubergine baby um, flowers. Pepper, well capsicum, sweet pepper, long thrim. Uh, it was a long Italian name, so I've just written free. Because <laughs> that's an abbreviation, it's a long name. Ask me frig pepper. <coughs> Friggin pepper. And then I've got, oh, I'll start these all far too late, Bonica which is an aubergine, I can't remember what 
and their little flowers come in. The prettier own shades. I saw some somewhere else. And then I've got, oh no, and then there's some Kermit there that are meant to look like little frogs. What are they, Lizzie? Kermit? Kermit's meant to be good for curries because it soaks up. Um, but it's a pepper, aubergine. is it? It's an aubergine. They're aubergine. Than hairy ones. And then we've got lunchbox mix, which is lots of lunchbox size fruits. George likes his little fruits and veggies. Not necessarily. Little, little, it depends on whose lunchbox you're comparing it to. Oh, bye. <laughs> well, yeah, Lizzie, do you want to just show them the flowers so they know, you know, because people might not have seen before, you know, where the exactly. fruit comes behind the flower. They're a bit, bit young yet, I think. They're just starting to develop, though, aren't they? So that's that. These have got lots of little ones that have probably got more chance than the big one ones. I think round here, if you have lots of small plants, veg, they're likely to succeed a bit better. Yeah. But they're powering away. They're getting there. They are doing well under glass, obviously it gets very hot in here, um, which is what they need. I mean, those are big, those are respectable big plants. Um, and then I've got some... Fi... Cape gooseberry. Are they called Cape gooseberry? <sighs> fancy, fancy people eat them. Orange fruit has a papery crust around it. It's P-H-Y. Phasalis. Oh, like the lantern? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, the Chinese lantern, yeah, Faisalis, yeah. Is that the right one? Yeah, Faisalis. An edible one of them. An edible Faisalis. I've done right. them before, I think they're perennial as well, because I did them in here before, and then, then the next year they were everywhere. Yeah. I didn't know the edible, I didn't know there was an edible Faisalis, to be honest with you. But, um, so that's cool. Baby P. That's not looking quite so good. Oh, poor thing. Looks like it's got a little bonnet on. I've eaten some of them already. Pretty things in, but they don't seem to be causing a lot of problems. I don't really like spraying birds. So. Do you want to but show sorry, us what you're looking yeah. at, Lizzie? Yeah. That'll good you zoom. Yeah. It's those little brown buggers, isn't it? Oh, someone's coming to get them. Someone's coming to eat them. Is that an adult? Can you see the brown thing? Is that going to eat them? Or is it this parent? I think it's a parent. Mm. Look away if you have small children at home. But no, <laughs> I think it's a parent. I don't think it's going to do it. Well, not if it's a... Looks like... Aphid, what do aphids turn into? Or is that the end of the life cycle? Uh, aphids are just aphids. Oh, so they're not aphids. Looks like white fly, doesn't it? Uh, I think that's the skins, isn't it? Yeah. Have you composed yourself no, yet? Right, show the people what you're doing. Right, well, we are splitting some little dwarf baby diaries. So, if you clean all the dead off. Yeah. You tend to, you're best off doing them at this time of the year, the bearded irises. That's iris, I think typically Germanica is the species of them. Which, we try to do them any time, I think any time, mid-July to mid-August, you get away with doing them, don't you, Helen? Yeah. It's when they're at the happiest. You're the bearded Irish connoisseur here around oh, here. You're yes. the one who likes I, 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 I'm I, very unfussed, but you have loads, don't you? In your I do, I like a blousy flower. Right. Like your good self. Like my good self. So, try and look for the best... Um, place in which to divide, which I think it'd be down there, because you're still going to end up with two very you nice... You see where all the breaks are, can't you? Like, that one goes into there, and then they split off, and then they split off, don't they? So, if you get, take it down there, and you'll get two nice, handsome plants. Help to get uh, <laughs> a decent knife that doesn't move. You go on there, like right that down time. the right down the crotch. <laughs> like that, and then it should just tease apart. Yeah, they come apart nicely. All you do is do that first cut, don't you? Down that yeah, first rise, on then they part quite nicely, yeah. don't they? So there you go. Then just take off. Well, we take off this compass because there's actually no nutritional value in that anymore really no because they've been in this compost since 
last year and they're getting repotted this you know is their pot for the year they'll overwinter in these and ready to flower in the spring and we split the dwarf one pogo because we don't want to take them in a bigger pot do we so just little short ones but yeah. the dwarfs do tend to be very abundantly flowering so I think I'll put those into a three litre. Yeah, and you tend to you make sure, uh, even though we split them, we want a good full pot, don't we? Because the, the lake being quite tight and the thrive on neglect, don't they, these? The well, yeah, they don't thank you for a lot of water. Yeah, they want to be baking hot and dry. Yeah. Like these ones we've had in pots. Obviously, they're looking past the best. They've just been sat in that corner there after the flowered, waiting to be sorted. And they're just, they've been, they've been barely getting hand watered and they've not taken any harm for it. So we sort of three quarter fill the pot, make sure the roots are nicely in. But also, obviously, with it being a little beaded Irish, you keep the rhizome that's at the top you don't cover that and what is the rhizome helen that's for the this people piece. who don't know the that's fat the there. fleshy root at the top you keep that baking on the surface it likes to cook in the heat so, you do that and then Best off trimming off some of these. I do more so on the the um, yeah. taller iris because the, the thing is, it stops them from move, the wind getting them and then moving about. Yeah, when much. you've just uprooted them. Yeah, you see, I've never really understood why you do it, but you fan them in this sort of way. You see it more prominent with I'll throw them these big ones out here this is a nice one called Rajan Carnival Time you sort of fan the leaves like that just tidies them up a lot doesn't it Looks, yeah fanning them about there you go alright yep just like that <laughs> Life as a nurseryman doesn't get much better than this. I've just been working through, dividing off a load of our special alpines that we have here at Eggleston. We've got some really, really rare ones. Very, very lucky to get to work on. Slightly let them get away from us. Um, and I propagated a load last year, which have thickened up really well. From the slightly larger ones which are left, I've stripped all these down and made new plants. Some more next door, there's about 300 and odd I've made here of all different kinds. To say, some of them are very rare and very special. But it's really that process that, as a nurseryman, is the most special bit. But from a handful of plants, I've made about 300. And I'll make some more tomorrow. And probably the day after as well. And all we do with these, you'll have seen Malcolm do it before, I'm sure. Is break them down to their tiny little rosettes. Now you can go just to one rosette and a little bit of stem underneath, and um, subterranean stem. It's slightly academic, really, as to whether it's always a division or a cutting, because um, ideally they come away with a root on, but sometimes they just come away with a singular downward root. You know, and is that a cutting or is it a division? It frankly doesn't matter. You'll notice here I've actually gone to several rosettes rather than individuals so you can split them down to one tiny individual and start the plant all over again we would call that restarting a plant in nurserymanship but I've, I've gone a bit bigger than that because i'd like them to hurry them on a bit to have stronger more sellable plants and you do have quite a high failure rate with individual rosettes 
Um, not huge, but enough. Because when you have several, you've got a stronger little clump of material. But I love doing this job. It's amazing. So we're in the pottery shed and I've just finished splitting all the alpines. And I think we did a feature with the alpines before. Um, we're on the stock plants now. Um, and we're through all the guys we can split, you know, like the saponaria, which are fiddly, but you can do the saxifrage and stuff. Um, but these really nice helianthemum, um, raspberry ripple, there's no way you could divide that. I mean, it's coming off a central stem. It's just not the kind of thing that divides. We've got lots of stock plants, we've got lots of material, and we do want more. So we're going to take them as a, as a semi -right. Um The success rate's not probably going to be huge. Would you say, Thomas, and we'll lose a bit? But yeah, yeah, but that's why, that's why we have so many stock plants. Because it's just a lovely thing. Um, little but, rock rows. Yeah, but um, when it gets like this, yeah, it's they true. don't look a lot of it. As you can see on these ones here, all those dead stems were covered in flour. But yeah. They don't present themselves nicely in the pot, no. the, the helianthemum. But they are a pretty little thing. But I'll show you what we do. We've got our cutting mix we showed you the other day. Um, super free draining. Let people have um, a look at the label. Yeah. And um, probably... See, it's Malcolm the job of making a caption, you see. Wow. He doesn't always get them right. Uh, so that is the tender growth. There. Maybe you don't know what a semi-ripe is. Um, to the uninitiated, it's essentially growth that has not lignified, has not become woody, but it's been around for a couple of months, you know, so it's not fully solid off. And I'm going to take these with a heel to help it on. When I say a heel, I'm going to tear it from the stem, and that's my heel there. Okay? Oh, yeah, filthy fingernails. Um, well, it's part of the job. <laughs> um, that contains a lot of cambium. Cambium, as we've been over before with you, is meristematic tissue and therefore an area of cell division, therefore, is most likely to strike root. Okay, so we're stripping them off. We like have that. hairy fingers as well. It's like working with hacker T dog, you know. Anyway, um, I'm going to flick some of the hormone off. And you just you strip some of the leaves off to yeah, again strip expose some more cambium and then also... I do it like this with the tweezer just to help push, push them down, just so you don't... Um, Very good idea. Yeah, it's just so you don't kink the stem on the way down. If you shove that in and hit a bit of grit without realising, the, the stem, when it goes down, could bend up like that and you'll kink it and, and you've buggered it, basically. Um, you can also do it with a pencil where you slip it and sort of slip them down together and pinch it in. So I'll show you some more. So heal off. Yeah, because this is... It's very, very... Still very soft growth, this isn't it's not like very, a hard yeah. one cutting. Um, These are still they're not fully they're not fully turgid, but they're pretty flaccid. They are yet to fully lignify, is what Thomas is trying to say. He's referring to organic polymers, he does that. Um but you can see how when I'm stripping them off as well, I'm not pulling them straight down like could be something because I've if you do it too much, you're just gonna pull the head off and bugger it up. So it doesn't you know, we're not gonna do that. You could do you need to do a bit fiddly, you know it's a fiddly job. Um, let's take that off, but you can see some of the material, that's not really worth bothering with, there's not enough material there. That guy I am going to try here, yeah. let's get that out of the way, and again, with your heel, like that's the kind of job you can't do in gloves, you need to have the full feeling in your fingers. Yeah, well, I was told at one point that you should wear gloves doing cuttings because if you have, yeah, like sweaty hands and get the salt in them, or yeah, uh, all the oils, uh, but... yeah, like the bollocks, isn't it really? I think there's so much else to contaminate the cutting. How do you know you haven't got crap on your gloves? Um, we do wear gloves a lot just because we do this all day, every day, and you just find that you get all kinds of cuts and infections and stuff in your fingers. Um, I do like doing it barehanded; it is nicer, but um, we do have to wear gloves. That's a really good one there. Yeah, nice and tough. So it's not fully lignified. It comes off with a heel. And just being careful. Normally, as I say, you could go, but we can't do that. Yeah, because these are sort of close between being a semi-ripe and just a tip cutting. But yeah, we're, we're yeah. calling them a semi-ripe because of the time of year. Traditionally, yeah, tip they're down near a softwood, to be spring. honest. Um, so these are. But they're going to go in, and these will go in a little propagator in the back. Uh, it's not heated, but it is a propagator to protect them. Um, Keeps the good humidity and up. Yeah. I'll probably grip the top as well. And we will come back to you 
once we're dividing these off and let you know how we do in terms of failure rates. Right, ladies and gentlemen, it is nibbing time of year, and now it's everyone's favourite time, where we show everyone how to multiply their plants in a more effective way than just digging it up in the autumn or in early spring, chopping it in half with the spade. Because what we've got here, it's quite aptly named actually, this little cornflower, Centauria bella. It's a very, very early centauri, one of the earliest ones, and it gets a beautiful heads of little pink coneflower type flowers, obviously, your typical centaurias, you either get the big yellow napweeds or the blue coneflowers. This is a really, really nice one, and because it's an early flowering one, we find we prefer to split it now to get a decent pot full to go into the winter to then just pot up and get ready to sell in spring. You can see these ones, obviously they've done their thing already, they're getting a bit tired. They're just covered in weeds and liverwort. So it is the case of, I should have probably prepared this already, but you get it guts and all. So you get the weeds out, you find a good point to where you split it. Because this centauri grows slightly differently to others. Some of them are like little clump farming. Ones where this one appears to have these, it just runs from little woody stems rather than it being a clump farmer. So get rid of a lot of this old stuff here. And then you get a look out at where you get little breaks. I'm leaving these as quite thick potfuls, but like any that, that bits just come away, it's not a waste. So that one will just get chucked out, have a heap on the go of little individual pieces that I throw in together to make a pot full. But as you see here, you can see where these ones are going to pull apart quite nicely. You can almost follow, you see they have these woody like underground stems on this one. And it's a case of just teasing apart where those stems are so you get a nice little bit here. I'll strip off a lot of these old leaves, only want a few of the new ones left. But then quite a bit of this old woody stuff that's underground, it, it's of no benefit, so it might as well be got rid of, because that little piece there has sufficient roots to sustain itself there. And then this one, if I was wanting to, if this was a really, really something that was really highly sought after, or something that we... It's a, it is a beautiful thing, but we know that we're going to make plenty anyhow, because if I wanted to, I could, and I'll show you actually as well, just another example, each little shoot uh, has its own roots on, so I can just gently tease them apart, just like that. Because if I wanted, I could put each individual one of these, but because I want them to be a decent, full, good value potful in the spring, I will probably leave those two together and I shall pot them up just here. I have a little bit of compost in the pot already. Just thread a lot of the roots in. You can see there, that's a cracking little pot full that will probably get potted up to make another nice one in the spring. So it's, there's its mates here and these eight pots will probably make about 40 and like I say if I really wanted to I could easily make more but at least I've got 40 decent potfuls and then any that we don't sell in the spring next year will go through the same process and it just keeps going and going and going. Don't you dare say you were recording. <laughs> don't you dare. <laughs> I, I will not go to prison for that. Oh. Sorry, Thomas, I missed that. Would you like to repeat for the no, audience? I will no, I will Thank you very much. Not doing it. I'm not, oh, I'm not. Cut, cut, cut. This is where the best, this is where the best shit happens. <laughs>